Okay, g'day all, welcome to another video. We're going to be talking about uh, Python functions today. So a function is just a reusable block of code um, so that we don't have to type things out 500 million times. Um, a lot of functions we've seen already, uh, things like print and string, but there's a whole lot more supplied with Python that we'll have a look at as we go. So root is an example. Um, a function basically takes some input data, it performs a bunch of steps, and it returns some value optionally. I'm always doing that. Okay, so a little bit of terminology. Before we can use a function, we have to define what it does. Um, a function definition is just like a blueprint. It's a bunch of steps that the function will do. And then to actually run the function, to run that code, we've got to call the function uh, or execute the function. And often when we call or execute a function, we pass arguments or data to the function, although some functions don't take any data. Um, yeah, parameters or arguments. Um, just the word there for the data that we pass to a function in order for it to compute. Okay, so the definition of a function starts out with def keyword. Then we've got the function name, which is one word, no spaces. Uh, you can use underscore if you want a space. And we follow the function name with a parameter list and then a colon. And for the function body, we tab everything across once. Um, so all of this stuff just here is the function body. But the moment that we have a statement that's tabbed less than the function body, well, the definition of the function has finished. And yeah, this is the function up here, and this is not. Um, so to call a function, you just supply the function's name and in Parentheses, you supply the arguments that the function requires, so x, y, z in this case, although they don't have to have the same names as the function, as we'll see in a minute. Um, if the function returns a value, you can set a variable to that return value, so sum var equals whatever the function computes. Yeah, it's all, it's all good. So this is another, another way to call the function just here. All right, but let's have a bit of an example so we can see what's going on. I have to go pretty quickly. I'm cooking a pizza. And then pineapple. <laughs> um, all right, so at the top here, I've got a function definition, area of a rectangle. And it takes two parameters, side len one and side len two. And all it does in the body is multiply those two and return that value. Yeah, so note that return keyword just here is how you specify that the function should return a value. Um, and down here, you note that this line just here, this statement is tabbed one less than the body of the function. So this statement, is not in the function body anymore. It's not in the function definition. So the function definition is only those lines there. Um, all we're doing just here is reading input from the user. Um, we can have a look at float and input later, but this is just going to prompt the user and then read whatever number I type in at the keyboard. And we're saving that to side one. And then the second variable, we prompt the user again and read side two. And after that, we actually call the function with this line just here, area equals area of a rectangle, and then we pass side one and side two as parameters. So this area variable just here will be set to whatever the function computes. And side one variable passed as the first parameter will become side len one inside the function. So you know that the variable names don't have to match. Um, yeah, the function calls it side len one, uh, but it doesn't matter what, what the caller calls it. Yeah. And side two will be passed as side len two. And then at the end, we just print out that result. Okay, so let's have a bit of a look. Let's pass five and input side two, we'll go seven. The area is 35. There you go, the function computed 35 by multiplying five and seven, side len one and side len two. Good stuff. It should be 35 units squared, but let's not get too pedantic. Okay, so my second example here, which is really great is another function we'll use this a little bit more when we describe the next sections the next bits on functions but another another little example this one takes three parameters x y and z and it computes the smallest yeah so basically just printing the um, smallest out there of the parameters 67 18 and negative 4. i shouldn't say smallest really i mean it's 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 negative so so the least i guess you could say um, but the smallest of those three numbers is negative four, so that's what the function computes, negative four. Yeah, so just another second example just there, which we will use when we come to these next little bits. 
A doc string. If you want, you can supply a small description of what your function does as a doc string. This is just a string supplied as the first statement of a function. And we have a bit of a look. Uh, this is for the programmer more than anything. Um, compute, I'll say find. Find the smallest of three values. Stop putting semicolons and parentheses. This is a doc string just here. It's for the programmer and for the documentation writers. Um, just so that you can be reminded what the function does. And in Visual Studio, if you hover over the function call, it'll actually print your doc string to the screen. So find the smallest of three values. Just save you from forgetting what your function does. Okay, default parameters. So if you don't need your user to supply a value for all parameters to the function, you can actually supply default parameters. And you do that in the function definition by saying that a particular parameter equals something. So we just put 9999999 right there like that. This is a default parameter. So the Z value has a default value. If, if I, the caller, don't supply a value, it will default to something. So first of all, we can run the function again with just three parameters. And we can see that it still outputs negative 4 as the smallest. All good. Uh, but now that we have a default parameter, we don't actually have to supply three values. We can run the function with just two. There you go. So 18 is the smallest out of 67 and 18. Uh, it's actually computed the smallest out of 67, 18, and this number just here. Yeah, so the Z parameter has defaulted to its huge value, uh, which is obviously not the smallest of those three. Um, yeah, because I haven't supplied a value for that Z parameter. Okay, so that's default parameters. You can have more than one if you want. So this could have a default parameter as well. The Y value could have a default. The Z could have a default. And we could run it with just one uh, parameter. Um, you can't do this, though. Yeah, that's illegal. So you've got to make your default parameters the final parameters of your function. Let's see what it says. Default value must be specified here. Yeah, there you go. Because I've specified a default value for x. Yeah, I hope that makes a bit of sense. The default parameters must be specified last. Keyword arguments. Okay, so if we just get rid of this and we go back to our numbers that we had before, whatever they were, I can't remember what they were, and it probably doesn't matter. Normally, when we call a function, the parameters are assumed to be the same order as the function definition. So the 67 just here will be passed to the x. Uh, variable inside the function. The 6 will be passed to the y variable and the negative 5, which is the third parameter, will be passed as the third variable or the z. Uh, but if you want to mix things up for one reason or another, you can actually specify a different order. So we could say here that y equals 67, um, z equals 6, and x equals negative 5. And if we just put a little stop just there. So these are, these are called keyword uh, arguments or keyword parameters. Um, okay, so the x just here is negative 5. The y is 67. And the z is 6. So we've specified the parameters um, in a different order to that specified by the function definition by using keyword arguments or naming the arguments or parameters in our function call. Um, that's sometimes important if you want to help document um, which arguments are which, especially if you've got default parameters in your function. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to figure out exactly which variables are which parameters, you know, which variables inside your function body are correspond to which parameters. Um, so you might like to use um, keyword arguments. Okay, a little bit about variable scope. Um, a variable scope is the variable's lifetime or where the variable is visible from. And variables can be local to a function. So this answer variable just here was defined inside the body of the function and it doesn't exist outside. Um, yeah, this, this answer variable scope is only these lines inside the function body. As soon as the function stops, the variable answer doesn't exist. And we can show that by trying to print it out. If I try and print it out down here, 
Um, we should get an error. Yeah, there you go. Name answer was not defined. Yeah, so the variable is out of scope. It only exists inside the function just there. Um, but you've also got global variables. So global variables are visible inside functions and outside them. So if we define a global variable at the top here, and I just get rid of this line just here, this variable just here is global. So it's defined at a tab level less than the body of the function. So the function will be able to see uh, the global variable. I shouldn't say it's tabbed one less. That's not the reason it's visible. Um, this variable just here is defined in the global scope. I mean, it's not defined inside any function. It's defined in the global scope. <laughs> Stop saying global scope. Let's go... Um, something like that. So this, if it runs, will show that my global variable is visible inside the function. And if we... print it out down the bottom, we should be um, fine as well. Okay, so the smallest um, value that we passed was negative 5, and we ended up multiplying that by the global variable, just to show that the global variable was visible inside the body of the function. And so the function actually returned negative 500, yeah, or negative 5 times 100. And then just to show that global variable is also visible in the global scope, I mean, it obviously is, um, outside of the function, we printed the um, value of that variable, 100. Yeah, so that's just a little bit about scope. Global variables are visible everywhere, and local variables are local to functions. And that's about it. So there's actually a lot more to functions that we haven't looked at today, and we'll probably look at a lot more stuff uh, in upcoming videos. But for now, uh, that's about all that I wanted to say, and I want you to have a really good day, and thank you very much for watching. Yeah.